G'day, welcome to the show. I'm Osher Ginsberg. It's the big lessons from 2023, the, the biggest lessons that I got out of making this podcast. Uh, I've been making it for, this is our 10th year of doing this show. I love making this podcast because I love, I love learning new things. I love connecting with a guest. I love connecting with you. Uh, and I, I started this show for a reason, and that reason is still very, very true because the way I live my life is to... Uh, the only way I've, I've managed to get better and stay better is because I am committed to making today better than yesterday. It's just something, a little tiny little thing. I'm committed to doing the work, whatever it is that I need to work on, because the, the work is worth it. The, the lessons I've learned from making this show in 2023 have been brilliant. I've been sharing a few over the last few weeks with you. Some of the lessons have been very difficult, which is one of the lessons we're exploring today. A few weeks before we as a country in Australia went to the polls to vote in the referendum on a voice to parliament for Aboriginal people, um, a representative body of Aboriginal people to uh, advise the government to be enshrined in the constitution so it couldn't be taken away. Uh, we had a referendum on that and we as a nation, we voted no. Uh, a couple of weeks before that happened, Thomas Mayo came around to my place to talk through things. Thomas is a leading, was, is uh, a leading campaigner uh, for the uh, Yes campaign. He's one of the custodians of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. He's a truly inspiring man. He's a father of five. He's a masterful storyteller, an incredibly adept communicator, and a man who has just got so much empathy, so much understanding and passion and space It's profound, just profound. I reached out to him after the vote went down. I, I, I reached out to him on the Saturday night and you can imagine he was understandably um, heartbroken. Um, there's a lot of lessons for all of us out of what happened around that referendum vote. For me, uh, the lessons that I got out of it was that unless there's bipartisan support for an issue in this country, the unfortunate lesson that I saw is that no political party is beneath putting themselves and their own interests before human lives so they can score a win over the other guys. That was really hard. It's a hard lesson. It's, I mean, acceptance of it, but it's pretty hard. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, the lesson that I learned there would be that um, our electoral system is way more vulnerable to misinformation and disinformation than I think we as a nation might realise. There was a Trump strategist, Steve Bannon, had a saying, uh, the media is the enemy, the best defence is to flood the zone with shit. There was a lot of people flooding the zone with shit. In the months leading up to the announcement of the vote, before we had a date for the referendum, as a majority, we as a nation were largely in favour of an Indigenous voice to Parliament. But by the time it was polling day, that number had flipped and there were people voting no who were truly convinced that the voice to Parliament was actually a UN land grab. The lesson I got from the whole experience is that our relationship with objective truth in our country is in critical danger we need to really, really figure out what to do about it. And it's something that has to be defended, has to be protected and has to be upheld above all, el above all else, regardless on where you stand ideologically. We cannot make a decision as a country if we do not have a common narrative. And that's the thing that we truly, truly have to figure out. You're about to listen back to Thomas Mayo. You're going to hear what he had to say in a couple of weeks. It was a couple of weeks before the um, referendum. And you listen to him speak with such passion, such heart about the cause of agency uh, around Indigenous Australians in our nation. And as he speaks, try to, try to let some of the arguments that came out against the no vote play around in your head and see if you're listening to someone who's representing a UN land grab. Do a bit of reality testing about what Thomas has to say. I truly don't care how you voted, I really don't, but I do really care about the integrity of our electoral process. Um, I do not think it's a stretch to say that um, 
there were enough people in our country who made a decision in the referendum that was not based on a truth or a fact um, that should cause a huge amount of alarm in our nation around the way we vote for things. And what we saw in October 2023 20, is something that we should all be very concerned about, in my opinion. There's parts of this that are going to be quite hard to listen to, considering how things turned out. However, you listen to the things that Thomas is talking about, the issues that he's raising, no vote or not, those problems are still there. Those problems haven't gone away. And the work we as a country need to do is still in front of us. Regardless of what the referendum result was, we owe it to each other. And we owe it to the other people in our country that do the work. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Thomas Mayo. Thanks for coming over, man. How you feel? Yeah, I'm good, yeah. Sorry about yeah. Sydney and their oh, terrible traffic. Terrible. Shocking. <laughs> just wrong turn after wrong turn it was. Oh. Yeah, and getting out of Brookvale was just, uh, yeah, very slow. Brookvale to the east's suburbs, like in peak hour, that is, you may as well yeah. be trying to get into Mordor. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. It's yeah, like right. as the gnarliest, <laughs> that is the gnarliest kind of journey or attempt mm. on a, in peak hour. Uh, but I'm, I'm bloody grateful you come over, mate. Um, yeah, thanks. I, and I, I've told you this, you know, on the phone, but Audrey and I both were forever affected by uh, the night that we met you. We yeah. were, were at, a, at a dinner party, I guess. Yeah, Peter Fitzsimons yeah, place. Yeah. yeah, we were at a party and... Peter invited you to just kind of, you know, acknowledge the moment. And so brilliantly, you kind of talked about, you know, quite respectfully in the man's home, you said, I don't want to do a, an acknowledgement of country. And you kind of explained why. And ever since then, uh, it, it changed the way I do it when I speak publicly. But I'm wondering if you could just kind of talk a bit about um, how you feel about that, because it, it really changed the way I think about it. Yeah, well... It was a, a long campaign to see the Uluru Statement from the heart um, recognised by a government to take it to uh, what we wanted, a referendum to enshrine a voice in the constitution. And yeah, when we, uh, it was pretty spontaneous, you know, Peter said, jump up on the coffee table and <laughs> Van Albo was in the room. Uh, he was the opposition leader still at the time. So just... You know, got to recite the statement in front of everybody. I was trying to, I was trying to downplay yeah. that night. It was a crazy night. It was like I'm standing there yeah. with Audrey, yeah. and like, you know, Kurt Fernley's there, Albanese's behind me, and he's going to be yeah. the prime minister about six weeks from then. Yeah, and, and, you know, then you stand. He's like, Nah, stand here. Peter's a giant bloke. Yeah, yeah. Stand up here. Like, what are you going to do? Okay, yeah. I'm going to get home. <laughs> And and you stood up on his coffee table and the place was just silent. Yeah. No, it was pretty special because, uh, yeah, lots of, uh, you know, big names there and all that. And I knew it was a pretty important moment to mm. try and move people. But I'd been doing it for, I think, uh, almost five years at that point. So, yeah. But when you speak the Uluru Statement, it's so different to oh, reading it, right? Yeah. When you, you talked about how... Because today someone has heard an, an, an acknowledgement of country. Like mm. listening to this podcast, today someone's done a Zoom meeting or someone's been at work or school and yeah. they've heard it. And he talked about how it can lose its power and it can be kind of rote. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's an important thing for us to do, uh, but it needs to come from a genuine place. And I think when you've got something like uh, an opportunity to help people to understand the length and breadth of our struggle, which mm. is what the Uluru Statement covers, and the reality of our moment right now and what the solution is, then, you know, uh, I think that's uh, an important way to acknowledge country as well from time to time. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. And. I thank you every time it happens when I when I stand up there. It doesn't take any longer. Yeah. Um, but to just find out a bit about the country and yeah. to kind of speak about it and try to reference, you know, what it is to, you know, pass down. Mm. Like you hear you upstairs, you walk through at my home, it's full of birthday balloons. <laughs> yeah, that's a cultural thing that we yeah. do. And so to yeah. explain it's like passing down culture, like, why is there balloons on my birthday? It's a cultural thing. Yeah. Why am I blowing out a candle? Fuck yeah. knows. It's a cultural thing. Yeah, why thing. do we sing that same yeah, song every time? Yeah, it's the same time? song. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a cultural thing and it's important yeah. to us. And, and and there's similar – and just people kind of go, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's not yeah. – you know, it's, 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 it's the tiny little nuances of life. Yeah, and Indigenous people were punished for practising their culture, for speaking their language. Could you imagine that? You know, yeah. if you're saying happy birthday, you had to, you know, you get locked up for weeks or, you know, 
capital punishment. That's what we went through in this country. Oh, my gosh. Thankfully, you know, Australia, we're a risk-averse nation, and, and thankfully there's, there's, you know, we're not the first people to figure out that digging stuff out of the ground can be valuable. You know, other countries did it first, and we just kind of followed a model that was put together by other countries. So thankfully there's other countries that have been through journeys that are, you know, we can draw from. Uh, and I think about uh, Canada, I think about South Africa, and I think about Germany, like three countries who uh, have kind of tried, nothing's perfect, but they've tried really hard to move forward from, you know, in some cases, just like like horrific atrocity, or in all cases, horrific atrocity, and trying to make move forward in, in, in a way. What can we what can we learn from a place like, say, Canada, for example, where well, the treaties truth are in place? Is, uh, they've done better than us. You know, we're behind when it comes to how we uh, treat Indigenous people. Uh, they have already got constitutional recognition of Indigenous peoples in those countries, and. Um, they already have treaties. Uh, and so, you know, what we're trying to do this year, which is to simply recognise that Indigenous people exist in our constitution and to do it in a way that gives them a say about the decisions that are made specifically about them. Um, that's just uh, that's just catching up with the rest of the world. And the Uluru Statement says, you know, we're the most incarcerated people on the planet, proportionately. Uh, that is here in Australia, this yeah. first world country, the most incarcerated people on the planet. Yeah. Uh, and it just shows what the difference could be if we caught up, uh, we recognised Indigenous people and we gave them a voice, um, then you'd see um, that gap close and that's one of the great reasons why we're proposing it. It's extraordinarily moving, but there's a line in it that breaks my heart every time I, I read it or hear it. Um, that our, our children are alienated from their families at an unprecedented rate. Mm. This can't, cannot be because we have no love for them. And then it, it goes on to talk about this, you know, these, uh, this, this underscores it, like the systemic nature of, of our problems. Like for, for, I don't have any systemic problems. I'm a white, straight, cishet man living in a world that has systems that are completely designed for and policed by men who look exactly like me. Mm. You know, my wife has more trouble engaging with the world than I do because she's a woman. My eldest, she's 19. She has, you know, it's different. Yeah. So systemic problems are like, it's. It, you may as well be telling me a fairy story. Mm. Um, could you talk a bit about, you know, what that looks like, for example, you know, for example, like the obvious example would be the justice system. Like, Yeah. Like, I think uh, if you like, I'll res recite that. Please. That, um, that section of the statement says, proportionately with the most incarcerated people on the planet, we are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. So it's a, I think it's the most powerful section of the statement as well. It, um, and what it's basically putting to the people that uh, are listening to it or reading it is that if we are proportionally the most incarcerated people on the planet, if our children are, you know, um, being taken from our families uh, because of social dysfunction and things like that, then that's not a matter of who we are as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's not uh, a matter of our culture because we have a beautiful culture, uh, a generous and sharing culture, um, a culture where we, you know, um, love our children like any other culture does. And it's not a matter of our DNA. We're not uh, less human than other people. Uh, we're not a different race. You know, we, we are the human race. Um, we're a, a, a distinct people because of our connection to this place for over 60,000 years and indigenous uh, to this place. Um, and so really it's getting to the point of, well, there must be something politically and structurally wrong. And it goes to, you know, what you were talking about, the systemic issues that uh, we can fix this by changing the system to recognise our existence, which hasn't happened before. The Constitution explicitly excluded us and still somewhat does because of a lot of Australians are unaware that 
in the Constitution, there is a, a section called the Race Power, Section 5126, and it gives the federal parliament the power to make special laws about a race of people, and it's only been used to make special laws about Indigenous people. And in the 1990s, there was the Hindmarsh case, and the Hindmarsh case was Aboriginal people in South Australia uh, that argued in the High Court that that race power should be used for our benefit, not for our, not to our detriment, not to harm us. Um, but the High Court found that the race power could be used to harm us, um, and it's not necessarily for our benefit. So you see, that's that's the there's a systemic problem there, and so really. The proposal in the Uluru Statement later on, um, we call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. It proposes a solution uh, to this systemic voicelessness uh, to be able to see better decisions made about us. And um, it, it shouldn't need to be said, though, right, that, you know, our kids are in prison not because of their indigeneity, uh, but because of a systemic problem, and we can fix it. It's so easy. I mean, you, you talked before we came in here. You talk, you're going to you're going to go and speak on a. Um, I won't say it out loud, but you're you're going to go and speak on a news channel after this. And as soon as you said the name of the news channel, I was like, "Fuck!" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> um, that some particular news outlets, let's be honest, make a lot of money sensationalising the particularly the. Uh, the engagement of our indigenous people with the with the justice system. And yeah. that's it, you know, like I saw footage the other day of kids being chased through the forest with dogs. Mm. People look that look at that and like I I can, you know, not get chased by the cops. How come they can't? You well know? you've got to think about why kids are doing things, right? Yeah. And like any anybody, right? Whether you're an adult, you know, with the you know, various you know, issues in your life, there's there's always a, a reason, you know, there's always something that has happened that causes a person to act in a certain way. Um, and I, I, I really want people to think about this. Uh, earlier this year, a politician flew into Alice Springs and tried to argue basically that the youth crime in Alice Springs was a reason not to constitutionally enshrine a voice. But I want people to think about the youth that are running a, you know, running around the streets in towns like Alice Springs, uh, close to many Aboriginal communities. Um, in 2015, 2014, 15, when Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister, he cut hundreds of millions, over $500 million from frontline community services. And it led to the WA government of the time announcing that they would um, need to shut down over 100 communities by cutting off services. And there was national protests, and but, you know, nonetheless, uh, massive cuts to frontline services in, in remote communities. And you've got to think about what those services were for. Uh, those youth that are uh, running around the streets now, when they were babies, and many of the youth have fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, have uh, traumas carried from generation to generation. They needed those services. Those families that were struggling, uh, they needed those services. And so there's a repercussion, um, a decision uh, by a politician to cut all of this funding, you know, a whole lot of this funding for important services, failed those children, failed those babies. Uh, and so, you know, now you have, uh, you know, not just those babies that are youth that are, um, you know, spiralling, committing crimes, getting locked up, um, you know, as young as 10 years old, affecting them for the rest of their lives. Um, but you also have, you know, it doesn't help those families. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't help uh, the broader community because it perpetuates the yeah. behaviour. Um, from generation to generation. So it, it's a real failure of our system. And what's missing um, is a voice. If there was a voice back in 2014, 15, you know, we could have communicated with the Australian people about what the effect of that would have been. 
Um, the voice that we're talking about this refer referendum is one that Indigenous people choose. So our communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people choose representation. The voice that existed back then, and this is interesting when you think about uh, the goings on in this campaign, was appointed by the Prime Minister, not by Indigenous people, and it was Warren Mundine. It was Warren Mundine who was leading the No campaign now. So we can do things better. Indigenous people should have a say about who speaks for us and we should be able to speak uh, to the government and the parliament about what the solutions are and to defend against harmful decisions that have repercussions down the track. You know, when I, th when I think about, you know, I've tried to put myself in, you know, have, you know, put myself in another person's position. Would, would I want decisions made about my life that have made by people who have no, we talked about birthdays as a cultural thing, like, like a, there's there's no birthdays, there's no birthday parties. We don't sell birthday balloons in any shops. You can't get birthday cake, birthday candles are illegal, you're not allowed to have them. Like, it would fuck me off <laughs> yeah. if someone else said, no, 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 we've decided that's bad for you. If someone yeah. from out, yeah. with no cultural knowledge of what is important to me and my family decided yeah. something for me. It's just common sense, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to make a decision about someone, listen to them. And I hear this from kids. I go into schools. I read my children's book, Finding Our Heart, which is about the Uluru Statement. And um, I invite the children to respond to the invitation in the Uluru Statement and what they feel from the book. Um, and uh, the, the final words in the book, uh, you know, will you help find the heart of the nation, which mm -hmm. is talking about, you know, our culture and our voice. Uh, and... They come up with the most profound responses, you know. They, they, we drum fairness into our kids all the time, you know, at school and at home, and they just have this. Uh, they just, they just get it. They're like one of the responses that I, I'll, I'll always remember is, uh, it was year four, a class of year fours, and this little girl said, when we're going to play a game in the schoolyard. Uh, we, it's important that everybody gets a say on what the rules will be so that we can enjoy the game together. You know, it's like, yeah, that's it. Talk about what the rules are, will be together. And you see in 1901 when this country was federated, you know, it was, it was all white men. There were, yeah. there were no women yeah. uh, and certainly no Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And in fact, they said that we would die out, would soon die out. When you talk about that kid, and I see it in, in Wolf, and I see it in G, uh, kids come out like that. They come out with empathy and they come out with kindness. We are, mm. as, a, as a species, we come out cooperatively because that's the only way we survived. Like one of us can't kill a mammoth, but 40 of us can. That's the only way that we survived, right? And then there's this point where permission is given I guess, to go, yeah, but you're different from that person and that makes you better. And particularly if it comes from someone you trust, like a parent or a teacher or, uh, I don't know, someone that you look up to in the society, that can be hard to, because then you kind of identity, your identity gets kind of stuck to that. And then, you know, you have this, this kind of struggle of like, well, if I, climate change is a perfect example. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't know, put solar panels in my house because it means that, you know, I won't like my dad because my dad just like, rah, 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 rah. you know, then there's this mm. really kind of strange kind of identity thing that goes on, uh, particularly yeah. with like ingrained and, you know, generational attitudes towards our First Nations people. Uh, that, that's a hard nut to crack, mate. Well, where do you go? How do you go in there? It is, but it's changing, you see. Uh, a lot of, you know, young people, uh, are the strongest supporters of uh, the constitutional change that we're talking about at this referendum soon. Uh, you know, so it, it's it's the older generation that are stuck in, in their ways generally. But at the same time, I see uh, so many older people getting involved in this campaign. I think the majority of volunteers are certainly that older demographic. And I think it's a result of, you know, the question of how do you crack that nut basically is... There's been great work done truth-telling to the nation over the, the years, documentaries and books and movies more and more, reconciliation breakfasts and weeks and NAIDOC week and, you know, all of the acknowledgement of country, um, royal commissions that have been done, you know, that are full of evidence, truth-telling. 
There's this great swathe of uh, truth-telling work that has been done um, across our society, and that is shifting people. And so I, I think um, there are still those that are, will never budge from their prejudice uh, and their, you know, their ignorance. Uh, but I think most Australians are ready for this moment um, later this year. We've just got to help them get through the disinformation that is being fed to them by um, people that should be leaders, but uh, you know they're choosing their own interests over the uh, the national interest. Yeah, Audrey and I were talking about this last night, um, and she was interested to know because she's someone who looks at it this way. Is like, well, what does that person have to gain by yeah. backing that? And I'm like, well, I'm I'm trying to think in my heart, like, what what do you have to gain? Uh, as, uh, you know, for example, and right now we're speaking about it, uh, Peter Dutton's the leader of the opposition. What does the opposition have to gain by having a, a no vote passing as their legacy? Yeah. I think uh, another way to frame it is what do people have to lose by voting yeah. yes? Yeah. I mean, uh, what we're talking about here, and I can paraphrase the the 92 words that will go into the constitution it's basically this in recognition of aboriginal and torres strait islander people as a first peoples one there shall be an aboriginal and torres strait islander voice that may make representations to the parliament and government on matters relating to indigenous people and the parliament decides the rest so to summarize it's just recognition through a voice to have a say with an expectation that people that make decisions about us will listen. That's what we're voting on. It's yes or no to that. And so there is nothing to lose for, for anyone. I mean, there is disinformation out there to try and scare people that they're going to lose something. But we've seen all of this before. Um, and, you know, a lot of people don't know the history of uh, Indigenous struggle. So I'll just summarise a, a, a several things that will show that this fear mongering is nothing new. Um, in, the, in the late 60s, when Indigenous people were seeking equal wages, uh, and there was the Gurindji Wave Hill Walk Off, the, the song that Paul Kelly and Kevin Carmody sing um, uh, from Little Things, Big Things Grow was about it. But when Indigenous people across the country were seeking equal wages, they said that the businesses would shut down, you know, that cattle stations would no longer be able to operate without their, you know, basically slave labour because they were just getting rations, uh, the sustenance to work 16-hour days with no time for anything else. When um, land rights uh, happened in the Northern Territory um, under a, a Liberal government, it was um, Fraser, they said that people would lose their backyards. Um, it didn't happen. Land rights came in in the NT. No one lost their backyards or their cattle stations or their farms. Uh, in the late 80s, when Bob Hawke established um, a voice, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, um, John Howard said that it would be a black parliament and that it would have the power to, you know, um, clog up the wheels of government and veto legislation. Well, ATSIC came in and it didn't do any of those things. Um, but as soon as Howard won power, you know, he got rid of it. He silenced that voice, which is one of the reasons why Indigenous people seek constitutional enshrinement of a voice, because we know every time one government sets it up, the next one comes along and gets rid of it. Um, but also then in the 1990s, uh, people would have heard of the Mabo case that um, overturned terra nullius and uh, um, established native title in our common law. People were saying, you're going to lose your backyards again. You know, you're going to lose your farms. You're going to, you know, you're going to lose something. Native title legislation passed through, you know, was established. Nobody lost anything. And here we are again, you know, simply calling for decision makers to listen to us through a voice and people are being threatened that they're going to lose something. Yeah. They're not going to lose anything. It's just an advisory body yeah. is what we're talking about. And I, I've, I've been over those words. They're pretty the, simple. There's this information... <laughs> It makes me gnash my teeth. I can't imagine how it makes you feel. But to hear to hear the leader of the opposition stand up there and go, there's no details, there's no details, when fully aware that it literally is like, here it is, we're just making sure it can't be removed by the next government. 
what it looks like will be debated in Parliament and you will be a part exactly. of it. Exactly. You will get it to decide. You'll be a part of it. Mate. Exactly. Yeah. And then all the details are there. Again, it's just recognition by yeah. establishing a voice that can make representations on matters that relate to us. That's a detail. You see, the way our constitution works is it's quite a small document. It's a little, you know, it's about that thick. Yeah. Um, and this little book just contains... Um, the principles, really, of how our democracy works. It doesn't contain all of the detail of how everything works because that would make it inflexible. You don't want to have a referendum every time that you want to, you know, update, uh, you know, uh, a law about um, local government or something mm. like that or taxes. They need to change all the time. Things need to improve. Legislation needs updating. Um, and so the Constitution, uh, as an example, um, provides the parliament the power to make laws about the collection of taxes or to make laws for the defence of the country. It doesn't say how much tax. It doesn't say where the army bases will be or <laughs> yeah. how many tanks we have or anything yeah. like that. The parliament is elected and held to account in elections by us to, to make those laws. Um, and so similarly, the constitution is just going to say, recognise Indigenous people and we're going to listen to them. That's the principle we're voting on, yes or no. When it comes to, uh, you know, connecting with uh, our First Nations people or Indigenous people, uh, yeah, I'll be honest with you, Thomas, I was 19 mm. years old when I met the first person in my life that was not a white guy. I grew up in Queensland, in Brisbane, in Bjorki Peterson. So yeah. probably by design, I knew, I saw the guys who were sitting in the park, but I didn't know anybody. Yeah. They were yeah. just, oh, like, yeah. and I heard all mm. the jokes and I went to the kind of schools where those were the jokes. And yeah. I went to schools with the kids whose parents owned the cattle stations and stuff. Like that's, yeah. so that was ingrained in my mm. subconscious, you know, it was very yeah. weird. And then I met this amazing guy and we went to school together, went to a music school together. Mm. I got really lucky because there'd be guys I went to school with that never had that relationship. Mm. And I was 19 yeah. when that happened. Um, for people who, I, I guess, you know, have, have not had that kind of relationship, you come from a background where um, solidarity is a big part of the union movement and it's, in fact, it's founded on solidarity. And if there's a lot of, you know, unions are bad or unions are great, depending on <laughs> yeah. where you are. Unions are great if you're in them. Unions are terrible if you're trying to, you know. <laughs> you yeah, know. Well, I would argue unions are great for all of us because we wouldn't have universal health care or superannuation or annual leave. Oh, look, I agree. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I agree with you. Enti I agree with you entirely. But there's a narrative. There's yeah. a narrative of you know unions are bad. Yeah, uh, there is. Though it, it's founded on on the premise of so on, of solidarity. Yeah. Now, regardless of how you feel about the union movement, uh, can you talk a little bit about about solidarity and what it what you can gain from being in solidarity, even being in solidarity with someone who you've never met. Yeah, well, you see, it works for, it's not unique to unions, you know, people sticking together with a common interest, you know, to, to strengthen a group of people. Like, as a nation, we operate like that, you know, we're proud Australians. Um, you know, we all want to see our country do better because when the country uh, does better economically, socially, you know, uh, the happiness of the people, then we all do better. Our families do better. Our children do better. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's solidarity, uh, you know, is expressed, uh, you know, and is important to, to many movements uh, and many collectives of people. And, you know, I, I was proud to be a Wolfie and to learn about that solidarity and unity, you know, from when I was 17 years old, I was a Wolfie. Um, but uh, what made me most proud about being a union member was that we used our strength not just for our own to, you know, to uh, negotiate better wages and conditions just for ourselves. We used our strength of sticking together, um, of, of having a go to help other social justice struggles. And especially for me, you know, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and our recognition and rights. Uh, I mentioned the Gurindji Wavehill walk-off. You know, I worked with the old fellas that regularly took supplies from the Darwin, you know, from Darwin down to Gurindji country. Uh, I learned about the 1946 Pilbara strike when Aboriginal workers back then were 
uh, fighting for equal wages and how wharfies and seafarers refuse to export the cargoes from those pastoral stations in solidarity with Aboriginal people. And so solidarity is something that I think all of us do pretty much every day. You know, uh, as you mentioned, human beings, we, we are stronger together, working together. And so, you know, what we're considering here in this referendum is solidarity with Indigenous people. We have never recognised Indigenous people in our constitution. Uh, we have been marginalised and that shows in the statistics. You know, we, we have a life expectancy of around eight years less than other Australians. Um, we have twice um, the rate of suicide uh, in, you know, amongst our people. Higher, I think it is, for our children. And, and as the statement says, the most incarcerated people on the planet. In the Northern Territory, almost all of the time, 100% of the children in youth detention are Indigenous children. Jesus. You know, that's, that means there's no non-Indigenous children a lot of the time in the youth detention facility in the Northern Territory. Uh, that says that we've got a problem. So solidarity means, you know, we've got our hand out. We want to share our culture, you know, um, over 60,000 years, something that our children are proud of. They're always so proud of Indigenous culture. Um, our hand is out. You know, take it. Give us a hand up. Give us a say. And it's that simple. You mentioned that you work with some of the guys who, you know, were around for the, the Wave Hill walk-off. Like, I can only imagine... You know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, Thomas. You're a powerful presence, all right? The way you speak, the way you are. When I first heard you talk, I was like, that guy's got a thing. Uh, and it's taken you far because you know you know, you have a way of communicating. You know that you have a way of connecting with people and this is your superpower. What were the kind of qualities that those guys had, the guys that were, you know, part of that mm. incredibly historic movement? Oh, look, so different to, you know, you were talking about the rap that unions get, just so different from the rap that we get, you know, like just great empathy, you know, great care, really, you know, put themselves out there for others um, unselfishly uh, and, and genuinely. Yeah, we could stand up and fight, you know, and stick together and, you know, lock arms together and that's how you get things done sometimes. But it, it, as as a way of just standing up um, for your rights and for others, um, they, they were great, great people. I went to um, the anniversary of the Gurindji Wave Hill walk-off, the 45th anniversary, so um, quite, quite a few years ago now, uh, with Brian Manning, one of the fellows that um, had taken supplies down there. Uh, he was in his 70s by then. Uh, and I witnessed the respect uh, and um, the affection between those old fellows, those old Gurindji fellows that had walked off um, with the old wharfies that were there, Brian Manning, Jack Phillips, and, um, you know, that solidarity and standing up together uh, led to a great love. And, uh, you know, I'm only just thinking about this as I speak, uh, and it reminds me of makarata, which is one of the words in the Uluru Statement, which is a process of coming together after a struggle. Um, and it's basically a dispute resolution process for the Yolnu people. And the thing with Makarata is once the dispute is resolved and you've, uh, you've, you know, you've come together, then you come together closer than you were before. Uh, a person that was aggrieved is brought into the family as a, as a loved one. And I think when we vote yes, you know, that's the unifying thing about this moment. Uh, when we accept the invitation from Indigenous people, then we're going to be closer than ever before. And that's something that is, you know, really good for this country and for our children. It's difficult to hear you speak about those, you know, the the solidarity between those those men, um, uh, Jack and and the other guys, uh, and not be moved, you know, not be moved by this idea of look, I I see your humanity, and if your humanity is diminished, so is mine. So I am here for you. Like that in itself is. So, such a powerful thing. Yeah, that's solidarity, right? Like, um, what's the saying? An injustice to, you know, to one, you know, is an injustice to all. The the standard you walk past is a standard that you accept, sort yeah. of thing. You know, it, um, and I think that's the principle of solidarity. Um, you know, we're we're also the the MUA. Um, 
wharfies and seafarers are very much uh, an international solidarity uh, union as well because our, our seafarers especially sailing around the world back in the day uh, saw uh, how uh, people would you know different conflicts around the world and those types of things um, but also wherever there was war uh, it endangered them as well you know mm. like um, so you know there's this uh, one of the things that uh, I'm proud of about the way that um, unions have done things is that um, in the apartheid struggle, uh, seafarers refused to take uh, cargoes, you know, of oil to South Africa to put pressure on the apartheid regime. You know, that's those, and you've got to think about this. When these sorts of actions are taken, they're, they're real sacrifices. You know, you don't get paid. Your family goes without. Um, and so, you know, it's it's something that I think is very Australian as well. And it's why we enjoy good workers' rights. You know, mm. we have a, a society that um, is functional is because we do have a sense of solidarity and fairness. Oh, yeah, man. When, I'm, when I came back to Australia, I'd lived in America for 10 years, and I come back here, I was like, oh, free healthcare, no guns. Yeah, how good is that, yeah. right? No? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, how good is it? It's just incredible. It changes society. You know, society. you don't go broke if you, you know, you need to go to the hospital. Mate, yeah. I watched that happen. Yeah. Dude. I watched that happen. Yeah. I think you, your kid breaks their leg, you can't make the mortgage because what, you're not going to put pins in their leg? Yeah. What? And then that's it. You lose your house. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, it's the same principle we're thinking about this referendum. You know, yeah. there's, there's a real struggle going on. It's fair to recognise Indigenous people. We were here for 60,000 years. Why would we say no to that? I've always got this feeling, Thomas, there's, there's more pie than there is pie chart. This idea that if I give something to somebody else, it means there's less for me doesn't, isn't really real, uh, particularly when we're talking about stuff like this. What would you say to people who are afraid they might lose something or they're at risk of something? Uh, the simplest answer is look at the words that will go into the constitution. It's an advisory body. It can make representations. There's nothing in there about a third chamber of parliament. Uh, it doesn't give indigenous people a right to veto the decisions of, of parliament. Um, there's nothing that says that we can take anyone's land or charge rent to people to be on Aboriginal land. There's nothing in there. Of that mention of money regard. at all. No, no. It's it's a it's the ability to make representations. It's advisory to the parliament. Mm. The, the third part of it makes it really clear um, that the parliament uh, decides all matters relating to the voice, including the composition powers, functions, and procedures of the voice. So it's just advisory. Mm. Um, and so if anybody has been led to be concerned about losing anything or um, having extra costs because of uh, recognising Indigenous people with a voice, um, it's absolutely false. Absolutely false. The voice can advise whatever it likes, but the parliament who we elect still makes the final decision. Is there a... Because you mentioned the, the Makarata Commission, which is a part of uh, the Uluru Statement, and the, the voice is the first part of this in the Makarata, uh, is is to follow. Do you think, is is there a, because I wonder about this, is there a, is there a sense of shame of like, oh, I kind of know this? It, do you think there's that? that thing that some people may not have processed of like, I kind of know all this. I know how terrible it is and I know that I benefit from it. But if I accept it, then I, you know, mm. the, the, and this is played on by a, you know, a no campaign is like yeah. the responsibility is now yours. It's your yeah. fault. Yeah. Um, where do you think shame plays a role in this? Mm. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's the same reaction for some people. It's quite a significant step for people to accept the truth. You know, it's it's not something, uh, it's something that is undoubtedly difficult for people. Um, and I'll just say to those people, and, and I hope, uh, you know, that the listeners here uh, will get out there and say this to people in the, in the coming weeks, because uh, we're not far off from this referendum. It's okay to accept um, the truth of our past and the reality of the present. Um, there's nothing to lose and everything to gain by doing something about it. You know, let's let's heal this wound. Let's move forward together. Yeah. It, it's... <laughs> I... I would be so angry, Thomas. Mm. I'm feeling it in my body right now. I'm, I'm noticing how I want to cry 
with rage, yeah. how angry it would make me. How do you stay so calm in the face of such really blatant denial of humanity? Oh, I think firstly it's a matter of, uh, you know, the reality about our culture is it's not like that, you know. We were masters of dispute resolution. We knew how to make peace. That's why there's so many unique languages, you know, on this one continent. That's how we survived all of those, you know, uh, hundreds of uh, unique First Nations for over 60,000 years. Um, but secondly, it's because I understand that you don't achieve change uh, through anger. You can only achieve change like this where you where you communicate with other people why it's important to them and you move forward together. And that's why it's always been important in this campaign to make this something that is uh, supported across the political spectrum. You know, it's not a partisan thing. This is about all of us as Australians, recognising our Indigenous heritage and culture and giving a say to Indigenous people. Um, and we have support, uh, you know, from uh, conservatives, liberals like Julie and Lisa, who um, took a, a really principled stance yeah. um, courageously, resigned uh, from a, a front, you know, front bench position as a shadow uh, Minister for Indigenous Australians and Attorney General um, to be able to campaign for yes. Um, you know, Bridget Archer, uh, another uh, federal liberal that supports it. Um, the Tasmanian state liberals, uh, New South Wales here, state liberal, um, Chris Minns, uh, not Chris Minns, um, Mark Speakman. The Greens, you know, uh, independents like uh, uh, David Pocock uh, and the Teals. This is about all of us. And um, and so if we were just angry about these things uh, and didn't communicate and help people understand and bring them along, because there's been a lot of hard work to this point, yeah. uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, hard work to, to do that, uh, then we'd have no chance. And we do have a chance because we have that support across the political spectrum, big businesses to unions, you yeah. know, um, across the political spectrum. And, um, and that's going to be really important to success. There are people who might feel reluctant, um, but are worried. What do you think, what are the things that you've found when speaking with people who are, you know, I guess brave enough? To, I mean, to someone to tell you, I'm not going to do it, to your face, that's brave. Mm. What are the same things that you found when speaking to people who are reluctant that helps them understand or get some over the line? Yeah, well, well firstly, with people that are stuck in their um, position. Don't waste time with them. You know, once you've worked out they're entrenched, move on and find a person that um, has an open mind and will listen. Uh, I find that you, we should be respectful in those discussions with people that can be persuaded, of course. Um, listen to them, understand what their concern is, what their objection might be, um, and then you'll know how to, what information to find for them and to provide them. Mm. Uh, you know, there's great resources on the yes23.com.au, you know, the campaign website. There's some really great fact checking. RMIT has a, a whole lot of fact checking. Um, the Melbourne University of Melbourne and and others. Um, so use those resources and help people find the information they need to uh, to make a, an informed decision. And, and that's the best thing that we can do. But also I'd say share your reason, okay? Your story is important in this. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, not Indigenous. Your story, why you support this, um, because people can link with that. It's it, When you're talking about your own feelings and your own story, nothing's more genuine than that because it's your experience. Uh, and that in itself is a, a really great way to help people to understand and to decide to vote yes to. It's fascinating because it kind of plays to the, you know, it's why we see when the you accidentally buy a lottery ticket at a Westfield one day and for the next 20 years you get a envelope with a picture of a kid on it, you know, <laughs> you, yeah. know you know what I mean? They don't tell the story about the 100,000 people that are in trouble. They tell the story about this is Susan. It's, yeah. it's, it's the one person because our brains can't really relate to a giant people. But yeah. if it's someone that I know or have even only just met. It's interesting that, you know, because uh, the uh, one of the reasons I think it's powerful for, you know, a non-Indigenous person to share their why is that, uh, as you were talking about earlier, a lot of people have never met 
uh, an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people or have any relationship mm. uh, with any Indigenous people. And it's it's like um, like uh, Noel Pearson uh, said in the Boyer lectures this year um, that Indigenous people are the most unloved Australians. Um, and most unloved Australians because, you know, a lot of Australians don't know us and are easily led to believe the worst um, about us. Uh, and so, you know, your story, I think, um, is is something that's important because people can empathise with, the you know, someone that they know mm. versus someone that they've never met. Bruxy talks about, like, you want to engage, don't buy a ticket to Gama. You know, it's in your suburb. It's mm. near your house. Yeah. You just haven't looked because yeah. it is there. Like people, there's every, every, in every part of the city of every part of Australia, that the, the culture is there. The people yeah. Are there. And, and that's getting so much better. Like uh, that's one of the reasons why our children are so much better educated because, you know, they are um, meeting Indigenous people. They come to the school and share some culture and some songs and dance. And what we're, what we're doing here, I think, is inevitable. Yeah. Right. We are going to achieve this and we need to achieve it in our lifetime. So in this generation, in this, op this is once in generations, this opportunity, we won't get another shot at, at recognizing indigenous people, uh, in the way that we choose through a voice, probably not in our lifetimes. Again, this is important to consider because, uh, while I believe that our children will do it, if we don't, if we don't do it now, we're talking about real lives, okay? We're talking about a gap that doesn't close. The 2023 Closing the Gap report had uh, four of the, I think, 19 measures getting worse, <sighs> gap widening, and only four were on track. So this this voice is, is needed now. We cannot wait. Um, but I really believe in the next generation. Yeah. They're, they're, I wish they, I wish they could vote. <laughs> well, we were talking with uh, with G last night because she's only just started. She only just turned nineteen um, at the start of this year, so she's only been voting for a little bit. It's mm -hmm. the first election that she voted in. A federal election was this yeah. year, and so we've been having a few conversations with her about this, and we were trying to explain to her, you know, what does the country look like if it's no. Mm. and getting trying to get her to think about what the outcomes are for all of us. And mm. that's, that's a hard thing to think about. Oh, yeah. I, I was – it does. That, that does bring – I was talking to teachers last year at a school. Uh, it was staff and teachers, uh, not the students, about the referendum. And it really struck me. I wrote about it in a Saturday paper uh, a couple of months ago. But it just hit me when I – when I posed to them, how will you feel if this referendum fails, needing to teach the children about what has happened, this ignorance? And it just it just hit me. I, I, I rarely, you know, sort of uh, uh, lose control like that, but it was, uh, it was a harrowing thought um, because it, it won't be the status quo. Uh, and people need to understand this. And the status quo is bad enough, right? Those statistics that I talked about, the gap widening. It's not just the status quo if this fails. The great damage it'll do to the self-esteem of Indigenous children and all of us uh, if this fails. Such a modest proposal, just an advisory body, you know, to make representations on matters that affect us, it would be devastating. It would, it would make things worse. And yet the converse of that, like what do we have? What do we have to gain? That's the... It's just, it's blue sky. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just listening to a people that have never been listened to in a proper way like this uh, consistently before. This is, uh, there's everything to gain, you know, like for Indigenous people, we get to gain a voice, we get to gain uh, the ability to uh, bring solutions to the parliament. Uh, for the parliament, they get to gain um, the advice that they need, the guidance to uh, make better decisions. Um, for all Australians, uh, you know, we save 
taxpayer dollars and we save lives at the same time. All Australians get to do that because you see the voice will call out waste. It'll promote programs that are working. It'll defend programs that are working. It'll, it'll make a, a massive difference, uh, you know, to outcomes for every dollar, sp- every dollar spent. So um, you mean to say it will call out programs that aren't working? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It will call out programs that aren't working, uh, policies that are failing, you know, things that are wasteful because we don't want to see waste because that ultimately ends up yeah. in, you know, failed uh, the gap widening and yeah. those sorts of things. We want to see uh, better outcomes, but it also saves lives, of course. You know, that's that's uh, important. But we also gain as Australians over 60,000 years of continuous heritage and culture that we share, you know, unique in the world. Yeah. We'll, we'll become not a nation that's uh, only, you know, just over 200 years old, but a nation that's can, you know, boast that we are the oldest living civilization on the planet, 60,000 years. No other nation can claim that. Um, and our children certainly want us to claim that. They love it. When you speak to your kids about what's happening, what do you tell them? They, uh, they understand what I'm doing, you know. They understand that it's important. Uh, I've got five kids, uh, 26, 25 and 23, uh, and then uh, 10 and 12-year-olds. So they miss me the most. I'm hardly home. Uh, but they they understand that this is important to them and this is important to their country. Um, they miss me a lot. But um, I'm looking forward to the referendum being done and spending more time with them. But that's got to be a part of you know, why it is that you're literally walking around the nation. <laughs> yeah. Because they were really yeah. little when you started all that stuff. Yeah, it? yeah. Um, it's been a huge sacrifice to uh, to be straight, you know, just uh, for the whole family, uh, especially nowadays with the vitriol and uh, um, the terrible sort of uh, attacks that we're seeing on, on any Indigenous person that steps up being labelled as elite, you know, and all this sort of stuff as if, you know, if, you've, if you're if you an Indigenous person that's done the hard work, uh, you know, that has educated themselves and um, is advocating effectively for their community that suddenly they're an, an elite that shouldn't be listened to. So my kids see that stuff too. But, you know, we all, we all know that this is something that's really important. Mm. One of the more powerful things that got told to me was like, you can't let perfect be the enemy of good. You can't not start something just because it isn't everything you want straight away. Just start working on it and then it'll f- and you'll figure it out. The idea that um, any governmental system is right at the start and if in perpetuity is bunkum. It's completely ridiculous. Like we have a neglection every couple of years because it's, oh, that's not right enough. And then not, and you look at Anthony Gurry and look <laughs> yeah. at the percentages and go, well, only this many people think it's this should be this way yeah. and that's close enough. Yeah. Uh, why would it be any different? You know, this is the thing. People are demanding this, this kind of precise precision uh, of delivery of this thing and they need mm. to know everything it's going to be and it's going to be perfect forever. Yeah. But that's not what no, any I mean, system in our country Imagine is. if that was the case in 1901 when they were negotiating the, <laughs> you know, if they wanted to know exactly how much tax would be, you know, and exactly yeah. where the, you know, this and that's going to be and how, like, they would never, we would never have federated. We'd yeah. never have become a nation. You know, that's why the Constitution is just the simple principles, you know, yeah. what powers do Parliament have? Uh, and then they make legislation and that evolves over time. So, and, and so like, you know, just as a an experiment, like, we vote yes. The debate happens. The first version of The Voice shows up. Mm. Bits of it don't work that great. Mm. What's the process then? Well, then we advocate for improvements. Yeah. Whether it's, uh, you know, the broader public or Indigenous people ourselves, you know, if it's 26 representatives and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, this border for this region should be changed to cover that area, you know, Mm. with that representative, then, you know, all of those things can be advocated for and updated by legislation. Um, If it was in the constitution, you know, it'd be too inflexible. Right. And and that's I think that's the thing that uh, some of the no campaign is is pushing on that like you're you're voting in this permanent thing that we can it's like it's not but it's yeah. not they're playing on that too you know because of course if we have, people need to think about this if we said it's going to be twenty six representatives and these are the regions you know this is how then what would happen. Uh, we're not voting on that firstly. We're not voting on how many reps and those sorts of details. But then people would start to debate that. Mm. There would be an argument that it should be 25 or 27, yeah. you know. Yeah. It would lose focus on what this is, the principle yeah. of recognition and listening. We're, and then, you know, I think about the last time we had a referendum, which was 99, 
uh, their obfuscation and the, you know the way that that was played, yeah. demanding that the details be there before we hit go, was just the recipe for it to be. Yeah, you know, and that kind of killed it before it started. We're voting on a starting point. We're not voting on a mm. on a on a finished product. Yeah, and so please, listeners, go out there and tell <laughs> yeah. people all you are voting on is recognizing and listening to Indigenous people. That's what this is. Yes or no to that? It's that do, simple. Do you want to be recognized and listened to? Or do you want everyone to feel that? <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> like, that's really it. Yeah, you that's know? it. That's what we're voting on. That's that's the really principle it. of recognition and listening. When you think about. Um, that, you know, and this is the other thing we were speaking with George about last night, was the ethics of the question. Mm-hmm. You know, when we think about the ethics that, that, you know, the ethics, the general ethics of our community versus another country, so for example, well, one, like a really a very obvious one would be, would be Russia right now. The mm-hmm. community ethics of that country, very different, you know, completely comfortable with, you know, destroying another country, like completely comfortable with murdering children with high-tech weapons, like fine with it. Mm. Uh, I don't think we as a country would feel so great uh, about that kind of, you know, thing. But when you think about the ethics of our nation, I think generally, um, you know, I've only, can only go on the same-sex marriage plebiscite, 64% of us are like, yeah, mm. you know, we're decent, decent human beings. And that's a huge number. When you think about the ethics of this question, we were, just what we are talking about with Georgia last night, the idea of just trying to do no harm mm. and to vote yes is is to do no harm. Mm. To vote no is to, as you mentioned, is to just definitely not just cause more harm. Generous invitation rejected, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, no. Um, and the world is watching us. You yeah. Know? The world is watching us. As I said, we're behind. You know, the only... We're the only like nation that doesn't recognise Indigenous people in the Constitution. Yeah. And surely we, you know, surely we can do that. We spoke about at the start what we can learn from other countries. And there's that um, plaque out the front of uh, the where the synagogue was burned down in Baden-Baden in Germany in Baden-Baden in 1938, um, pre, you know, it was just the, the, the beginning of everything mm. that got pretty terrible. Mm. Um, and I had family members that died in the Holocaust at, you know, I've met my uncle who survived a camp. It's, you know, it's very fucking real yeah. that a very educated, very smart Christian nation mm. believed they were doing the right thing yeah. and did this. And you look at Germany now, they live with this. And there's this really interesting line, knowledge is precondition, memory is duty, reconciliation is goal. And, you know, what what can we learn from a country like that, for example, that, is aware of this atrocity, this complete atrocity that the mm. world united against and yet carry on and still hold themselves as, no, I'm proud to be German. I can sing the same national anthem that got sung at those mm. rallies mm. when their football team wins and feel fine about it. What can we learn about ourselves and what we can do from here? Yeah, I think um, I think that when you can acknowledge um, those atrocities, if you can accept the truth, uh, and then do the work to do something about it, to acknowledge that that has been done, to recognise the people that have been wronged. Uh, that makes you stronger, you know? That makes you stronger. Uh, and that's what will happen when we pass this referendum. We will be a stronger nation for it. Our democracy will be stronger because there's no longer a people that are marginalised that have been here for 60,000 years. It'll see better decisions made by our parliament, you know, not a special right for Indigenous people, but, you know, to see better decisions made about us. That's simple. Uh, it will make us stronger. It's not less for me, more for you. It's more for everybody. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. This is, this is nothing to lose and everything to gain for all of us. <laughs> it really is. I mean, we keep saying it, right? But when you've got that disinformation out there trying to scare people, um, we've got to get out there and tell our loved ones, you know, uh, tell our friends and our work colleagues in the next, in the coming weeks, you know, just like in the marriage equality campaign, uh, it was only one because people got out there and expressed their care and empathy, uh, you know, about something that didn't affect them directly, but was important to all of us, our national identity and about fairness. I was thinking about this last night. Do I want to live in a country that's voted no? Oh, I mate. don't, like... Can you imagine? I don't know if... We've got to do the work. You know, yeah. I, I, I want people to volunteer. 
as we are making this podcast, we are only um, just over 60 days out from when the referendum may well be. Uh, we think it'll be the 14th of October. That'll be announced very soon, uh, if it will be. So we've got to make the effort, you know, and that's what's at stake. Uh, do we want to live in a country that said no to listening to a people that have been marginalised for so long, over 200 years? Um, if you don't want that to be the answer, if you want to celebrate rather than commiserate, uh, when the referendum is, then we need to do the work. So please volunteer, donate, do everything that you can to help. But to the the, the other point is like, do we want to live in a country that's voted yes, devoted yes to possibility, devoted yes for being together, to vote yes to go, let's figure this out. And indeed, let's w walk together for a better future for all of us. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> vote yes. <laughs> Like, what, <laughs> That's an what, we want. what an invitation. Yeah. And, yeah, a better future for all of us would be yeah. a, a beautiful thing, Thomas. Would you like me to recite the statement to finish? I won't stop you. <laughs> if, right. if you wouldn't mind. Like, okay, to, I, should, I just noticed you're a bit over No, time. don't worry about it. Like, okay. No, honestly, like, right. you, you, were, you were a part of this. Yeah. You were a part of this coming Out together. Of yeah. What did, it, what did it feel like when you all saw it for the first time and went, we're fine with that. That's what we'll go with. What did it feel like? Oh, mate, you know, like after so much hard work, there were 13 three-day regional dialogues, elected delegates met at the, in the heart of the nation, did three more days of debate and discussion. The Uluru Statement was read and the entire room, the entire room stood as one and endorsed it with standing acclamation and tears of joy and hope. It was, um, it was really really special and we knew that we had achieved something that could change the nation for the better. Yeah. The thing that's driving us to this referendum, the invitation that we're being asked to accept comes from the Uluru Statement of the Heart and you, sir, know it word for word. Would you do us the kindness? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Here it comes. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands, and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did, according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between a land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished, and it coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise, that a peoples possessed the land for 60 millennia and this sacred link should disappear from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They shall be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is a torment of our powerlessness. We see constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk in two worlds, and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarada is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. 
We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you, Osha. Thomas Mayo. Oh, buddy. You do me the greatest honour coming here today, mate. Thank you, mate.